Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're speaking with Rashid Khalidi, who is Edward Said, Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University and author, among other books, of the fantastic book, The Hundred Years War on Palestine, Settler Colonialism and Resistance, 1917 to 2017. Rashid Khalidi, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you very much for coming on, for the work you're doing, for this terrific book. Uh, and I will do my best pronouncing things, including uh, your name. But uh, when you say settler colonialism, uh, mm -hmm. you're describing Israel as a, as a European and in particular a British colonial project in Palestine. Can you talk a little bit about the origins of that project? Well, the origins go obviously long before the British get involved. Uh, the origins have to do with political Zionism, which starts in the 19th century. Uh, the British only become involved in 1917 with the Balfour Declaration, but that really changes everything. Up until that point, the Zionist movement was a project in search of a patron. Um, the, the founder of modern political Zionism, Theodor Herzl, went to the Kaiser in Germany, went to the French, went to uh, the Ottoman Sultan to try and get support for the idea of a Jewish state in Palestine, which was the idea. So Zionism at its start is a national movement. Zionism at its start is a response to anti-Semitism, but it goes on steroids as it, as it were when it gets the support of the British government. And the British supported as of 1917 with the Balfour Declaration for reasons that have nothing to do with philo-Semitism or love of Jews or even evangelical Zionism, which is a factor. The British get involved for purely strategical reasons. It's important to Britain to control Palestine and support of Zionism is seen as a means uh, to achieve that. So uh, it, that, that's the first part, the British part. The settler colonial part has to do with how early Zionists who were all Europeans viewed what they were doing. Uh, in their view, this was both a restoration of the Jewish people to their ancestral homeland and a European settler colonial project. Um, you have agencies of the early Zionist movement called the Jewish Colonization Agency. You have major leaders of the early Zionist movement like Herzl or, or Jabotinsky talking about the colonial nature uh, of uh, the Zionist project, bringing European Jews uh, to Palestine. So it's both a settler colonial project and it is a national project from, from, from the very beginning. It's, it's interesting that you mention evangelicism as a minor factor. Uh, I imagine a lot of people don't know it was a factor all the way back then at all and think, it, I, I mean, I'm thinking of this Christian religious belief that the Jewish takeover of Palestine is somehow a magical apocalyptic prophecy. Uh, that was around uh, 100 years ago, was it not? It actually started before that. You had people like Lord Shaftesbury, who was a very influential British politician and aristocrat uh, in the 1840s and 1830s, arguing for the rest of what he called the restoration of the Jewish people to Palestine as a Christian duty. Um, this had to do with an evangelical reading of the Bible and in particular of the, of the New Testament, and in particular of the revelation of St. John the Divine and other bits of the Bible, which during this revivalism in English, in England, I should say, uh, linked uh, what we now call Christian Zionism with this new reading uh, of the Bible. So this actually goes well back uh, over 100, well over 100 years, in fact. And we now have the latest iteration of it in, in the United States with, with Christian evangelical support uh, for Israel. The, the book, uh, 100 Years War on Palestine, is broken into six sections focusing on six incidents. And the, the first was the Balfour Declaration, but the second was what happened in 1947-48. Uh, what happened at that time? Was it an ethnic cleansing? Was it a genocidal campaign? Well, it certainly was ethnic cleansing. But what happens in 1948 is the absolutely necessary prerequisite for doing what Jabotinsky, among many others, understood was the whole point, transforming a country with an Arab majority into a country with a Jewish majority. You can't do that without removing the population. And in the end, it was understood by the Zionists that this had to be done by force. So it was an ethnic cleansing without which you could not have created a Jewish state in a country 
which in 1948 had a 65% or 66% Arab majority, simply would not have been possible. Um, and I, I talk about what happens in 1947, 48, 49, from the time of the adoption by the UN of the partition resolution in November 47, right up until the end of the war between Israel and the Arab states in 1949. I talk about that as a, a, a declaration of war, not so much only by Israel, as by the by the great powers, by in particular the United States and the Soviet Union. And I talk about the Balfour Declaration as a British declaration of war uh, back in 1917. So that, that's the way the six, the six chapters of the book are, are organized in terms of what I call declarations of war uh, on the Palestinians as, as part of my explanation of this as a war on Palestine, waged essentially not just by Israel or the Zionist movement, but sometimes by the British, uh, sometimes with the support of the United States, sometimes with the support of the Soviet Union or France or Britain. And, and your argument in part is that that has been too little understood and appreciated and addressed by some people in Palestine over many years, right? In Palestine and in the United States and in many parts of the world. There's a misimpression that this is just a conflict between Jewish settlers and the Zionist movement and later the state of Israel and the Palestinians or the Arabs. In fact, in addition to being a conflict between these two national projects, a Palestinian national project and a, and a, and a Zionist national project, it's also a conflict between the Palestinians and the great power patrons of Zionism. Without the British, the Zionist movement could not have been implanted the way it was in Palestine in the 1920s and 30s. Without British repression, the Palestinians could not have been broken militarily as they were from 1936 to 39. So the British don't just declare war on the Palestinians by calling for the establishment of a Jewish national home in an overwhelmingly Arab country. They then provide the force necessary to make that possible by crushing Palestinian resistance from the 20s through the 30s. And I argue that the same thing is the case going forward uh, in the 40s and right up to the present. In other words, it's not just Israel and the Palestinians. With, it's with the United States. Powerful external factors, most recently, of course, the United States. So just to, just to zip through the, the six sections, the third section uh, of the book, Rashid Khalidi, is about 1967. Uh, and as usual, we are often told the reverse of what happened in terms of Who's David? Who's Goliath? Who's who's the aggressor? Who's who's the defender, et cetera? So what happened in 1967? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I bring out are American government documents, which show, firstly, that Israel only launched the 1967 war once it had a green light from Washington. The Israelis are very careful not to make the mistake they made in 56 when they attacked Egypt with Britain and France without American approval. And the United, American disapproval forced them to withdraw from Sinai and to withdraw from Gaza in 1957. So in 1967, they want to avoid that mistake. They send the head of the Mossad, uh, uh, an officer by the name of Meyer Amit, who meets with the president, President Johnson, meets with the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, and gets a green light. Um, and at the same time, he's told what the American military and intelligence assessment is. You will crush them whatever happens. You will defeat them decisively and overwhelmingly, whether they attack you first or whether you attack. And it's very clear that even though people in the United States, people in Israel may have believed that Israel was on the brink of annihilation, that was never in the cards. Israel was going to win, according to these estimates by the CIA, by military intelligence, by the chiefs of staff, Israel was going to win handily whatever happened. It was overwhelmingly superior to all the Arab armies put together, which is in fact what proved to be the case uh, in June 1967. So I talk about this as, an, as, a, as a declaration of war, not just because the United States gives Israel a green light for the war, but because the United States then is behind the passing of Security Council Resolution 242 in November of 67, uh, which never mentions the Palestinians, which calls for a settlement which essentially ignores the Palestinians. So this is, a, this is a peace plan, which at the same time is a declaration of war on the Palestinians. You don't exist, you're never mentioned in this document, which is supposed to settle the whole issue, uh, a just settlement of the refugee problem, no mention of who's refugees or how it's to be settled, uh, is, as I argue, a, a declaration of war yet another, in a, yet another time uh, on the Palestinians, not by Israel, by the great powers, in this case, by the United States, with the support of everybody who votes for this resolution in the Security Council. 
There are some people who view what was done in 1967 and ever since, I think, for the expansion of Israel as unacceptable. But anything before 1967, including those events of 1947 and 48, as unquestionable, even unmentionable, how, how has that situation been created? Well, I mean, I think that something does change in 67. Israel occupies the remainder of Palestine, the West Bank, Gaza Strip, as well as Egyptian and Syrian territory. Syrian territory is still occupied. Um, but I think it ignores the continuity in Israeli practices or in Zionist and then Israeli practices as between the mandate period, the period of the 1948 war, and uh, the period subsequent to 1967. These include seizure of Palestinian land. These include uh, eliminating as much as possible Palestinian population, not through genocide, through driving the people out in, di in different ways. I mean, there are massacres to force them to leave in 47, 48, and, and other massacres. But this is not a genocidal operation. This is what one Israeli uh, sociologist called politicide. Uh, you are replacing uh, the Palestine with Israel. And you're doing that by trying to change the demography and trying to take over the land. Uh, legal measures, which in, in effect amount to stealing the land, but which in Israeli law are, of course, legal. And these are ongoing, not just in the under the British mandate, these are ongoing uh, during the period between 1948 and 1967, and have been ongoing in the occupied territories ever, ever since. In the fourth section of the book, we come to 1982 and a U.S.-backed Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Uh, and you were there. You report uh, in the first person on this one, right? Right. I actually, one of the differences between this book and other books that I've written is that all the other books are written, you know, in, in a historical mode, in my, you know, in my capacity as a historian, using the training that I had as an undergraduate and a graduate student, and that I, I, I've used even with books that were meant for a more general audience. In this book, I take off that. I'm still I'm writing as a historian. There's, there are 45 pages of footnotes. I try and document every assertion that I make, obviously. But at the same time, I try and make the book a little easier to, to, to read and to understand by putting in narratives of people in my family, other families, my uncle, my grandparents, uh, one of my aunts. I, 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 I describe things that they told me or things that they wrote down. Um, at the time. And then I described things my parents told me, my father and my mother, and then things that I witnessed myself. So even in the 1967 chapter, when my father was working at the UN, I described things that I saw in New York at the time or in the Security Council where I was sitting in the visitor's gallery uh, at the time. And in the 82 chapter, which is the fourth chapter of the book, I was living in Beirut. Uh, I was teaching at the American University. I was uh, 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 working as a researcher at the Institute for Palestine Studies. And I also would speak to reporters uh, as an informed Palestinian linked to the PLO. I had done work with the PLO. I was deeply involved in Palestinian politics. I was incorrectly described as the PLO spokesman. I was never that. There were people who were PLO spokespeople. But I, the things that I saw and witnessed uh, in Beirut during and after the war, including uh, the, the siege of Beirut by Israeli forces, the bombardments and so on, and then the Sabra and Shatila massacres immediately after the PLO forces left Beirut and the Israelis took over West Beirut. I described insofar as what I saw, I thought contributed to our understanding at the same time as using documents uh, like the secret annexes to an Israeli report on the massacres, which have never before been published and which reveal the degree of American complicity and Israeli complicity involvement, in fact, in these massacres. Uh, jump into the fifth section of the book. We're looking at the first intifada in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, I, I'm very interested in this question. Correct me if I'm wrong in understanding that much of the population effectively became somewhat self-governing through nonviolent, non-cooperative action. Sure. And in fact, this disorganized, spontaneous, grassroots, largely nonviolent effort did more good than the PLO had done for decades, in your view, and unified a resistance movement, shifted world opinion, despite co-option and opposition and misdirection by a PLO. 
oblivious right. to the need for influencing world opinion and utterly naive about the need for applying pressure on Israel and the United States. Is that right. is that accurate? You've summed it up accurately. I mean, in earlier parts of the book, I argue that the PLO had achievements, but I would argue that from the, the time of the of the Intifada from 87 onwards, um, the description you just gave is absolutely accurate of, of my views. Uh, the Intifada was a spontaneous grassroots, largely nonviolent. I mean, they certainly weren't using weapons or explosives. They threw rocks, they may have thrown Molotov cocktails, but most of it was non-cooperation, demonstrations, strikes, and quite ingenious means of opposing the opposition, uh, sorry, opposing the occupation. Uh, any demonstration of Palestinian nationalism was banned, simply raising a Palestinian flag would provoke repression. And so they did a lot of really quite original things. They shook Israel and American support for Israel in a way that really makes this, in my view, one of the few Palestinian victories um, in the entire history of, of Palestinian resistance to the takeover of their country by, by Israel. So yes, I think that that really does sum it up. And I think that, the, that the, this victory is squandered by the PLO in the subsequent negotiations, in part of which, the first part of which I took part as an advisor to the Palestinian delegation at Madrid in 1991 and in Washington in 91, 92, and 93. Was there any organized training or preparation or strategizing of nonviolent activist approaches leading up to that? Was it really spontaneous grassroots? And, and if so, how much better might it have been uh, with more investment and preparation uh, in, in the approaches taken? I mean, I, I was, I was, I visited Palestine a few times during the, the at the very, in the tail end of the Intifada. So I can't really give you a very good answer. I wasn't living there. Um, but everything that I've read and everything, I, everybody I've talked to indicates that there wasn't a great deal of preparation. This was largely spontaneous. Had it been better prepared, Israeli intelligence services might have, you know, squelched it. They have an absolutely obtrusive, all-encompassing intelligence penetration of Palestinian society. They did and they do. Um, so maybe that would have you know, led to the, the thing being aborted early on had there been a greater degree of preparation and organization. I think the fact that it was a spontaneous grassroots uh, uh, ad hoc, uh, in fact, increased its success. Um, and I think that that's been true of many Palestinian efforts since then, both, uh, both armed resistance and unarmed resistance. Uh, when uh, it was organized, it was much easier for the Israelis to penetrate and, 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 and squelch. Uh, right now, there's, there are things going on in the occupied territories, which uh, have, are, have, 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 I think, their force because they're not well organized. They're largely spontaneous. They're just young people without organizations behind them carrying out attacks on Israeli occupation soldiers um, and checkpoints and so forth. Uh, and I think that's true of a lot of, of strikes and, and demonstrations and, 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 and much less violent forms of resistance to occupation. The ones that are not organized, the ones that are spontaneous, uh, seem to have the most success. Obviously, they can't continue without organization. Uh, so this is not a long-term strategy. And I think that's a real problem that the Palestinians face, the, the terrible leadership that they have and the fact that there is no, no organization and, and, and no coordination of much of what goes on in the form of resistance, whether unarmed or armed. Rashid Khalidi, I, I almost dare not bring up the topic of Palestinian violence. It's, it's sort of automatically assumed I'm equating Palestinian violence with Israeli violence or sitting in the comfort of the United States, blaming Palestinians for the Israeli occupation or so forth. But there ought to be some way to talk about it uh, and to ask how you compare the, the nonviolence of the first intifada with the violence uh, sometimes perhaps counterproductive the of the second oh. intifada. Right. Um, well, I, I, I discuss this in the book. And I think that the failure of the second intifada and the success of the first intifada says something important about nonviolence. On the other hand, I think it should be stressed that any occupation, any settler colonial regime will inevitably and necessarily produce resistance. And that resistance will not necessarily be something that people sitting uh, drinking tea in New York or London or Paris will necessarily approve of. 
I think there are, are and should be limits on violence. I think violence against civilians is illegitimate under any circumstances. It's against international law and it's immoral. Um, but I think that settler colonialism in particular, where you're not just ruling over people, but you're taking their land, you're denying their national existence, you're in some cases ethnically cleansing them, is a particularly brutal form of domination that produces, unfortunately, a particularly brutal form of resistance. Uh, I don't think this is something that's unique to Palestine. You can look at Ireland. You can look at India. You can look at any at, at Algeria. You can look at any settler colonial or colonial uh, situation, which Palestine is. Anybody who claims that it isn't should spend a little bit of time in the occupied West Bank. This is a colonial situation. These are settlers stealing the land of the indigenous population. There's no other way of reading it. You can claim a biblical birthright. You can claim a biblical deed. But this is land Palestinians are on, have been cultivating, and have owned for centuries, for millennia, perhaps. It is being stolen from them. They are being replaced. That's settler colonialism. And that produces resistance. Now, uh, I grew up watching cowboy and Indian movies in which what the Indians are doing is brutal, terroristic, criminal banditry. Okay, But we now understand the resistance of Native Americans to white colonization was simply their attempt to preserve their control of their what they saw as their country and their way of life. And their elimination, their destruction, large to a large extent as a people, and certainly their dispossession, which has happened in most parts of the United States, is something that we now look at a little bit differently than we used to when we watched cowboy and Indian movies. The problem is we haven't gotten away from a cowboy and Indian reading of Palestine where the Israelis are just good guys and they're being attacked for no good reason. And they're just there, it's their land, it should belong to them. And anybody who says otherwise is just a bad guy. Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, because in the more sophisticated versions, they're anti-Semites. The only reason they do this is because they hate Jews rather than because it's their land being stolen from them by people who happen to be Jewish, which is in fact the, the situation. Uh, if they were Martians or if they were you know, people from an entirely different ethnic or religious background, there would be the same resistance. And in fact, leaders like Zeb Jabotinsky said that any people resists uh, colonization. And that's what we're doing, he said. And he wrote this in the 20s, uh, 1920s. I only wish people in Israel and the United States uh, were aware of the fact that some of the founders and framers of Zionist ideology, the, the, the person who in fact led the current that rules Israel today, almost all of them come out of the Likud Party, which is the outgrowth of revisionism, which is Jabotinsky's movement. I wish they would read what Jabotinsky wrote back in the 20s, because he didn't describe this as terrorism. He described it as resistance. And he described what, what Zionists were doing, in his view, justly, as colonization. What, what do you recommend after, after 80 years of this that people do, that people in the United States do, that people elsewhere do, and that people in in Palestine do that has the greatest chance uh, of succeeding? Well, what people in Palestine have to do is a, is, a, is a big uphill struggle because they have to, Palestinians have to, first of all, develop a competent unified leadership, which they do not have now. They have incompetent, politically bankrupt leaders who are more interested in fighting one another than they are in resisting occupation. Uh, Palestinians need a, a whole new way of looking at this issue. That, that's, a, that's one whole ish problem. Um, and that's not up to us sitting in New York or sitting in Washington or wherever we may be to decide. That's up to the Palestinian people to decide. What we can do as Americans, what we should do in this country is recognize that we are a party to this country. We are in fact the major party after obviously Israel and together with Europe in sustaining, supporting, funding and arming the occupation of Palestine in helping Israel to dispossess the Palestinians. We are not neutral. We are not an honest broker. We are not in the middle. We are putting our big, fat, imperial thumb on the scales on the side of the oppressor against the oppressed, on the side of the occupier against the occupied. That's, that's our responsibility to understand. First of all, we have to understand that, and then we have to do something about it. Um, it's our tax dollars that pay for the weapons that are being used. It's our tax dollars that are being used to subsidize settlements. How are they being used? 501c3s, tax-deductible charities, are being used to fund illegal settlements, settlements which by international law 
and in the view of the United States, are illegal in the occupied territories. We should, we, should, we as American citizens should, should say, I don't want this millionaire, this billionaire, this donor to get a tax deduction for supporting an illegal settlement. If they want to send their money to, that's their business. But why should they, why should we pay taxes where they don't pay taxes on these contributions to illegal, uh, uh, in this case, illegal settlements? There, so there are many things that we can and should do. The first thing we have to do is inform ourselves. And unfortunately, there's a huge weight, there's a huge cloud of misinformation, of obfuscation, of misinformation, of propaganda, which prevents a lot of Americans from, from seeing this. I think younger people are much less susceptible to this misinformation, which is why the polls show that young Americans have, I think, a much more balanced, healthy, objective view of this than people who are much older. We, we've got just about two minutes left. Rashid Khalidi, we, we are seeing Congress members defamed by the Anti-Defamation League for calling Israel an apartheid state when, of course, it very clearly is and in the view of all human rights organizations is an apartheid state. Right. We're seeing journalists lose their jobs uh, for reporting fa basic facts about Israel. Uh, the, the fact that young people are starting to get it is encouraging, but uh, how do we become able to say that uh, uh, in, in the media? Uh, how do we break through the, the censorship? Well, I think that the charge of anti-Semitism against people who are simply arguing for Palestinian rights is the last refuge of scoundrels. It shows the desperation of supporters of Israel who are seeing, not just among young people, but young people in the Jewish community, uh, a very large proportion of the Democratic Party, moving away from blind, unquestioning support for Israel. And this is the last weapon in their arsenal to say that anybody who criticizes Israel in certain ways, anybody who supports Palestinian rights, is an anti-Semite. When, in fact, all that's being said is, we're demanding justice and equality. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. If people can say, we want to have the right of national self-determination in this country, so should for Jews, so should Palestinians have that right. If they say we want the right to immigrate to Israel, Palestinians should have the right to return to their homeland. Um, what's being asked for is just equal rights and justice. And to smear such people as anti-Semitism, I have to repeat, it's the last refuge of scoundrels. They have no other argument. If they're forced to, do, if they're forced to do that, it's extremely unpleasant, uh, it, 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 and it, it and it it debases the struggle against real, lethal, mainly right-wing anti-Semitism, which is a serious problem in the United States and in Europe. Absolutely. Uh, very well said. We've been speaking with Rashid Khalidi, who is Edward Said, professor of modern Arab studies at Columbia University. And one of his books is the absolutely wonderful book called The Hundred Years War on Palestine, Settler Colonialism and Resistance, 1917 to 2017. Rashid, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. It was a pleasure. I appreciate it. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.